Buenos dias, everybody. Good morning. So welcome back from spring break. We are going to, well, we're not going to finish it today, but we're going to get pretty close. We're going to work, read uh, chapters 15 and 16 today. Um, so we're doing the best we can. I know you guys are working hard, uh, so keep at it. So let's go ahead and take a look here at chapter 15 and 16. So let's see if we can do this here. All right, and oh, all right. Hopefully, you're able to see chapter 15. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, if you remember, they had the choice of staying in the water with the Monte Diablo, who might destroy their boat and kill them, or go to the island uh, de los Muertos, the Isle de los Muertos, the Island of the Dead, where the natives there might kill you. So, tough choice. All right, chapter 15. Los Muertos is barren, like all the islands of our Vermilion Sea. But it has a snug, sandy cove where turtles by the hundreds come to lay their eggs. Into this, we made our way, beached the boat, and then climbed a low hill behind the cove, which gives a good view of the island. Isla de los Muertos is a small and mostly flat, and at its southern end, the Indians live out in the open without shelters of any kind. From the hill, we saw that evening fires were burning and people had gathered around them and that their black canoes lay in a neat row on the shore. We decided therefore that no one had seen us sail into the cove. We turned the boat over and emptied the water that had almost swamped us and ate more of the corn cakes. By then, <clears throat> excuse me, by then it was night. We wait for an hour, said the Seviano. Then we give the Monta time to find another boat to follow. We can wait for an hour or for a day, I said, but he will be there still. What do you mean? I mean that the one out there is the Monta Diablo. It was too dark to see his face, but I knew that the Sevillano was staring at me as though I had lost all my senses. Santa Maria, he cried. I am aware that ignorant Indians believe in the Monte Diablo, but that you, who have been to school and can read books, one of the mighty Salazars himself should believe in this fairy tale? Santa Rosalia, it surprises me. Furthermore, I said, he is waiting out there for the pearl, and he will wait until he gets it. The Seviano was leaning against the boat. He stood up and came over to where I sat. If I throw the pearl into the sea, he said, the Monta will take it, swim away, and leave us alone? Is that what you're getting at? Yes. The Seviano turned his back and walked over to the boat and gave it a thump with his foot, I guess to show his disgust. He then strolled off in the dark, as if he wished to be as far away from me as possible. The moon rose. Soon afterwards, from the hill above, I heard the soft cries and rustle of birds. Something had disturbed the terns that had flown in at sunset to nest. As I glanced up, I saw a figure outlined against the sky. I jumped to my feet, but did not call to the Seviano. Here was a chance to rid myself of him. I could climb the hill and tell the Indian who stood there, why I had landed on the island. He might give me help, for he would understand about the Monte Diablo. It was a dangerous plan, yet it might have succeeded had not the Seviano seen the Indian too. We go, he shouted. I hesitated for a moment, watching the Indian on the hill above me. The nesting terns began to scream and flutter about, so I was certain that other Indians had come up from the village to join him. The Steviano ran to the boat and turned it over and stowed the supplies that lay on the sand. Hurry, he shouted to me. I walked over to the boat and helped him shove it into the water. Where the pearl was, I did not know, whether hidden in the boat or in his pocket. Perhaps you would like to stay, Seviano said. The Indians of Los Muertos dig a pit in the sand and put you in it up to your chin and then let the turtles nibble at your face. But you would like this better than the Monte Diablo. 
The boat was floating and the Seviano had picked up the oars. Do you go or stay? He said. A shower of arrows came whistling down from the hill and struck the sand. There was nothing for me to do now except to scramble into the boat, which I did just as a second flight of arrows churned the water around us. The moon was near to full and the air was clear and the sea stretched away like a bed of silver. There were no signs of Monte Diablo. The Seviano put up the sail, though the wind had died and both of us rowed hard, fearing that the Indians would launch their canoes. For a long time we heard their shouts, but they did not try to follow us. When we left the lee of the island, we picked up a light breeze. The Seviano reset the sail and took a sight on the North Star and steered the boat eastward along the moon's path. All right, so hopefully now you can see the PowerPoint here. And let's get to chapter 15. Here we go. All right, so a turn is simply uh, a bird. It's a seabird. So there's a bunch of birds on the island, and that's what flaps and makes a bunch of noise. And then the Saviano says... <laughs> They will bury you in the sand up to your face and the turtles will eat on your face. So here's a picture of a guy buried and a turtle going to eat his face. That sounds absolutely horrible. And lastly, it talks about a shower of arrows. So we have an arrow like from a bow, an arrow. And a shower of arrows would be a lot of arrows coming down and landing near you. So this would be kind of dangerous, kind of scary. Uh, pretty intense. So they choose to go back out to the ocean and try it out there. So uh, 15 was short. We're going to go ahead and continue on with 16, which is also pretty short. So chapter 16. At sunrise, the island of Los Muertos lay behind us. The air was heavy and scarcely a ripple showed on the sea. Over and around us hung a thin red mist, but I did not locate the Monte Diablo till more than an hour had passed. It was then that a needlefish, longer than my arm, skimmed the water and flew by me like a bullet. I heard the chattering of its green teeth as I turned around to see whatever could have frightened a fish that is noted for its courage. The water heaved up half a furlong behind the boat. From this hillock rose the manta, through a shower of foam, he rose high into the air, higher than I ever had seen one leap before, so high that I could see the flash of his white undersides and his long tail whipping about. There he seemed to rest for a moment or two, as if to survey all that lay about him. Then down he came and struck the water, boom, with a thunderous blow. Your friend shows off said the Seviano. He spoke calmly, and I looked at him, wondering that now, even now, he did not know that it was the Monte Diablo who had leapt into the air and why he had done so. The Seviano took the pearl from between his feet and wedged it be behind the jug of water in the stern of the boat and picked up the harpoon. I have killed nine mantas, he said. They are much easier to kill than the whales of the same size because they lack the blubber of the whale. They are also easier to kill than the thresher shark, or the six gill, or seven gill shark, or the tiger shark, or the big gray one. The Monte Diablo sank from view. It was nearly noon before I saw him again. A light wind came up and ruffled the sea, and it might have been that he swam there close behind us all the time the Seviano was telling me how simple it was to kill a Monta and where he had killed the nine. I first saw the outstretched wings and then passed the boat, and I saw the amber eyes turn and look at me as they had once before. They said as clearly as if the words were spoken, the pearl is mine, throw it into the sea. It has brought you ill and fortune, and ill fortune will be yours until you give it back. I must have muttered something at this moment that betrayed my fear, for the Seviano squinted his eyes and studied me. 
He was certain at last that he had a child or a crazy man to deal with. The Monte Diablo swam by just out of range of the harpoon. Majestically, he swam on ahead of us and came slowly back in a wide circle. The Seviana waited for him with his feet spread apart and one leg braced against the tiller and the heavy harpoon in his hand. The pearl lay beyond my reach. I would need to crawl the length of the boat to get at it. Any movement I made now, he would see. So I decided to wait until the Monte Diablo drew closer and the Seviano would have his mind fixed upon him. Again, the Seviano looked at me. I'm beginning to understand a few things, he said in a soft voice, patiently, as if he were talking to a child or someone bereft. You stole the pearl from the Madonna because she failed to protect the fleet or your father. You traveled all night to the lagoon where you had found the pearl and you went there to give it back to the Monte Diablo. Is this right? I did not answer him. Well, he said, let me tell you something. It is news that you do not know, <clears throat> that no one knows except Gaspar Ruiz. He was silent for a moment, watching the Monte Diablo. But for one small matter, at this very hour, the fleet might be sailing under these same skies or riding safely at anchor in the harbor of La Paz. And your father might be sitting down in his patio to a feast of roast pig and good wine from Jerez. Anger seized me. I sat quietly and did not move. The Seviano saw it on my face. Calm yourself, he said, for I only wish to tell you why the fleet was wrecked upon the rocks of Punta Maldano. Maldonado. A better one never sailed the Vermilion. Your father was a fine captain. Yet ships and men and your father all went down in a storm no worse than others they had lived through. Why, you ask? I ask nothing. But I will tell you, mate, because it may take me some time to get rid of the Manta. While I am busy and not keeping a watchful eye, you might get a crazy idea. You might take the pearl and throw it overboard. Then I would have to slit your throat. That would be a shame, for the Monta did not cause your father's death. The Monta Diablo was still a good distance away and seemed in no hurry to overtake us, idly lifting and lowering his beautiful dark fins. But the Seviano fastened one end of the harpoon rope and coiled the rest in a neat pile at his feet. When the storm was gathering, he said, when the whole southern sky was filled with fearsome clouds, I told your father that we should turn back and seek shelter at Las Animas. He laughed at me. The wind, he said, was with us and we could reach port before the storm struck. It was a bad decision, mate. It was a bad decision he made, excuse me. And he made it because of the pearl, because of his gift to the Madonna. Not that he ever spoke of the pearl. Oh, no. Not once did he mention it while we argued. Let's see, did I read that right? Not once did he mention it while we stood and argued. And the wind blew and the clouds banked higher. But all the time, the black pearl was there in his mind. I could tell it was there, big and important. I could tell by the way he spoke. Seviano paused and raised his chin, striking a pose to show how my father had looked. It reminded me of the moment in the parlor when he had given the pearl to Father Gallardo and afterwards when he told my mother the house of Salazar would be favored in heaven now and forever. I could tell, the Seviano went on, by the way he spoke, so sure about the storm and everything, that he felt he knew that God had hold of his hand. The Seviano ran a finger over the iron barb of the harpoon and sighted along the shaft and made a few practice thrusts in the air. While he was doing these things, he said, if you had the choice to make over again, would you steal the pearl from the Madonna? I hesitated to answer him, confused as I was by what I had just heard and by his question. Before I could speak, he said, no, Ramon Salazar would not steal the pearl. Of course not, now that he knows why the fleet was wrecked. 
nor would he steal the pearl from his good pal, Gaspar Ruiz. Seviana waited for me to answer, but I was silent. I sat in the bow of the boat and watched the Monte Diablo swimming effortlessly along behind us. Already I had decided what I would do if he killed the Monte Diablo or if he failed. Whether it was one or the other, I now saw clearly how I must act and that this I would not tell him. All right. So uh, the needlefish uh, that's talked about at the beginning, it's like that because uh, we have a needle. Okay. And then the needlefish looks like a needle. All right. And then actual real manta rays, they jump out of the water. And here's a picture of a manta ray jumping out of the water and flying through the air, which is pretty amazing. I think Ramon describes it as majestic. And yes, I would agree. That's pretty beautiful. Here's a harpoon. It's a big stick with a hook on the end and you use it and you can, they use it to uh, kill whales, but also to fight a uh, manta ray. Uh, majestically, the L-Y again is the adverb. So here's some majestic pictures, these gorgeous, beautiful, amazing, powerful images. So when he describes it as majestic, uh, just imagine beauty and power and just something really cool that would be fun to look at. All right, slit your throat. I didn't uh, show this too much, but we did talk about the idea of the slit, the window slit, and how it's really tiny and, tiny and narrow. Here are the same words, slit, talking about your throat. So we got the knife, slit, make a tiny little narrow window in your throat, which would kill you, you'd bleed out. Should be terrible, terrible way to die. All right, so why did Ramon's father die? Ramon thinks that the Monte Diablo cursed his father and cursed the fleet because the Monte Diablo wants the pearl. So on one hand, it was this kind of magical power of the Monte Diablo that killed the father in revenge. But the Seviano, Gaspar Ruiz, says, no, 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 no. Your father was arrogant. He thought he had magic power because of the Madonna, but he just made a bad choice. The storm, it just came and destroyed him. So, which is it? Is it the Monte Diablo and the power? Or was it just a bad decision and bad luck? So that's what the story is asking us to think about. All right, you guys. I think that kind of covers everything uh, for those chapters. I hope you're doing well. So we will check back in uh, later. And then, until then, take care. Bye.